Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namaste So in every false argument there is a grain of truth that's the only thing that it stands on, uh, that 10% of truth, and then the rest of it is nonsense. But because of that grain of truth, credulous people accept it. They believe it because they are poorly informed about the reality. For example, yesterday we were talking about the Big Bang Theory, the Big Kablooey. <laughs> And what makes people accept this argument is that it seems logical. But there is never a case where something comes from nothing. So the fact that the scientists don't postulate the prior cause or the previous situation out of which the Big Bang may come means that the theory is actually nonsense. It's false. Why? Because it omits describing the conditions that create the Big Bang, that cause it. So, the Vedic teaching is much more intelligent. It postulates the prior existence of the subtle creation, the subtle material elements, as we discussed in the previous video on the 25 tattvas. So this pradhan is composed of the subtle forms of the material elements. In other words, they're subtle properties without the gross manifestation. This has to exist before the gross manifestation, which causes the Big Bang, could possibly come into existence. And even before that, there has to exist the intention, the creative will, the fiat of Brahman. Because after all, Brahman is the original source of everything. And what is Brahman? Consciousness. Pure consciousness without an object. Objectless awareness of awareness. In other words, Brahman, in its natural state, the Nirguna Brahman, is aware only of itself, not of anything else, because there isn't anything else. But then at a certain point, he manifests what is called the Icha Shakti. Icha means desire. And this is described in the Upanishads as, he desired, let me create. Let me be born. Let me become many. And out of this desire, he created the material elements one by one. Not in their gross form, but in their subtle forms. And this is the pradhana. The Sankhyas argue that this pradhana is actually the cause of the creation. And Brahman is only incidental. And the specific point that they pick to argue about is knowledge. Knowledge can also be translated consciousness, will, intention, visualization, imagination, etc., etc. Because all these properties are based in consciousness and come into existence along with consciousness as its qualities. So they are saying that See, and here's the grain of truth in their argument, that the mode of goodness, sattva guna, present in the pradhana, when all the gunas are in a balanced state, with no changes, no motion, no actions, this is the source of the knowledge that the Upanishads attribute to Brahman. In other words, they think the Upanishads are wrong. <laughs> Yet, they base their arguments on the Upanishadic statements. See, this is their hypocrisy. 
And when Shankaracharya points it out, they come back with the same old argument over and over again. Let's see what they come up with this time. Sankhya. Was it not stated that pradhana can become omniscient by virtue of its potentiality for knowing all? Vedantin. That too cannot be proved. If, during the state of equilibrium of the constituents, Pradhan is said to be all-knowing by virtue of having the power to know that actually belongs to sattva, then it can equally be said to have little knowledge on account of having the power of obstruction to knowledge that belongs to rajas and tamas. Besides, so long as sattva is not illumined by the consciousness of the witnessing soul, no change in sattva can be called knowledge, and insentient pradhan has no power to illuminate. Therefore, the omniscience of pradhan is not justifiable. The all-knowingness of the yogins cannot be quoted as an example, for they are conscious beings, so that they can become all-knowing through a perfection of their sattva. If, on the analogy of a heated lump of iron burning something because of the fire in it, it can be argued that Pradhan has the power of seeing owing to the presence of a witnessing entity, then it is but logical to hold that the entity owing to which Pradhan has the power to visualize is none other than the omniscient Brahman, and that is the cause of the universe. Again, it has been argued that even Brahman cannot have omniscience in the primary sense, for if it is an eternal knower, it cannot have any independence as regards the act of knowing. The answer to this is, Now then, you have to be asked, sir, how can one lose one's omniscience owing to one's possession of the act of knowing forever? It is a contradiction to assert that one has eternally the knowledge that is capable of revealing everything, and yet one is not omniscient. For should knowledge be non-eternal, one may know sometimes and sometimes not, so that one may as well become non-omniscient. But this defect does not arise if knowledge is eternal. So another grain of truth in the Sankhya's false arguments, is that knowledge manifests due to sattva. Sattva guna means the quality of goodness, and the quality of goodness is defined in Bhagavad Gita as that which leads to enlightenment. And we see, actually by experience, that when we cultivate sattvic qualities, Knowledge manifests automatically. This is a matter of experience of all sadhikas. So when one performs sadhana according to the directions in the Shastra, causeless knowledge appears automatically in one's mind. This is a wonderful thing. But it does not lead to the omniscience of Brahman. Why is that? Because as long as matter is unmanifested in the pradhan, the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas, remain in equilibrium, so there are no changes. But as soon as the cosmos is manifested and the elements are turned loose, these become unbalanced and sattva, rajas, and tamas are constantly competing, vying for influence. This is also described in the Gita, in the 17th chapter. So, therefore, one who bases their knowledge on sattva will be sometimes knowledgeable and sometimes not, because sometimes their knowledge, although based firmly on the sattva guna, will become covered by rajas and tamas, passion and ignorance. This is not a platform for omniscience, because if something exists sometimes and not at other times, 
it cannot be called eternal because it's temporary. <laughs> it manifests sometimes and sometimes not. Therefore, Brahman, whose eternal knowledge of everything, both in general and in particulars, is sung in the Upanishads, cannot base its knowledge on sattva, because sattva guna in the material universe is temporary, just like the other qualities. Therefore, the whole presence of the sankhyas is wrong. Although they, they do get some of it right, they do understand the preconditions for the manifestation of the gross elements in pradhan. But then they resist extending those conditions, those preconditions, back to the original source of Brahman. Why? Well, there's no good reason for it. They're simply envious, as I pointed out in the previous episode. They don't want Brahman to be more powerful than them. They want to think that they can become perfect yogis by cultivating goodness, sattva guna, and in this way become omniscient and therefore become equal to God. But this is foolishness. No one can ever become equal to God because no individual is everything. By definition, an individual is only a part. So because we are partial, because we are infinitesimal, actually, not infinite, <laughs> but infinitesimal, infinitely small, we can never know everything, even though we can achieve all-pervading knowledge to a certain extent, by yogic cultivation of goodness, sattva guna. This is something within every sadhaka's experience, that the more they can become detached from passion and ignorance, the more they can cultivate pure sattva guna, the more that transcendental knowledge, the light of Brahman, manifests internally. This is a wonderful thing. But it's not the same as being Brahman. That occurs at the time of self-realization, when even the mode of sattva is transcended. One becomes beyond all qualities, whether goodness, passion, or ignorance, or any of their combinations or derivatives, and comes to full knowledge of the self. The self is Brahman, not only the self, but ourselves. We are simply a reflection, just like the sun reflected in numerous water pots. The water pots are not the sun. They don't have all the qualities of the sun. But the image reflected in the water is identical with the image of the sun perceived in the sky. So, in certain ways, our knowledge can become similar to Brahman, but never identical, because of the fact that we are individuals, we are particles, we are partial, we are infinitesimal, atomic. But this is also the key to self-realization, that by cultivating the mode of goodness, we can approach Brahman, and when Brahman is satisfied with us, he can reveal everything, and this is the perfection of self-realization. Aum Tatsat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.